Hi there, I'm David Staples with the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here today with Keith Drine of the Edmonton Journal. Hey, Keith. Morning, Dave. How are you? Good. I just gave myself my first self haircut of, oh, well, since I was a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> I am not ready to. And try we won't that get into that. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually this is the this 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 uh, quarantine is the revenge of the bald people. We're the only people who can properly give ourselves haircuts. We just shave That's our right. head. That's right. <laughs> So today, Keith, we're going to uh, be going through some of the top tweets, top 10 tweets from Alberta and around the world. And of course, this is the list that I've compiled and you're picking off that list, tweets that you found interesting. And and we're trying to cover the whole political spectrum, uh, left and right, and, uh, you know, have views from both sides. Um, and I, and I uh, and again, I want to preface this because it's important to do this. We're, we, we are two journalists who are not experts. We are non-experts and we are just trying to make sense of it because there's a really important public discussion that has to go on. And I know some people recoil from this, that journalists or the public would have any say or any, dis but we do. We're all on the front lines of this particular issue. It, any of us could get this disease. Any of us could lose our jobs because of this disease. So there's a huge public stake. There's never been more actually of a public interest. And there's never been in some ways more of a need for journalists to deeply engage with this, with the public, tell politicians what we need, because they need to hear. They're going to have Jason Kenney, Pierre Trudeau, they're going to have some of the top, the, the toughest decision of their, of their entire political careers coming up in terms of when to open up the economy, how to do that, how to balance mass unemployment with uh, the possibility of mass death, which they would get blamed for. So yeah, there needs to be a public discussion about this, and that's what we're doing right here. Yeah, so although uh, I correct you but, on one point, I hope that Pierre Trudeau doesn't have anything uh, to do. With did I see Pierre this. Trudeau? <laughs> yes. <laughs> there you his, go. Uh, his DNA so on lives my... on in 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 Justin, who will be deciding <laughs> a lot of this. But uh, yeah. yes, uh, Pierre, and um, unfortunately or unfortunately, is not part of this uh, at the moment. <laughs> so. Geez, I wonder what he'd do. <laughs> it's a good question, right? The it's one prime, the one prime minister that put in the War Measures Act. So, yeah, yeah, he might have not have listened to the provinces when the province said says no, you 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 do not call a state of emergency. We do not want you to do that. He might have uh, overridden them on that one. So, thanks for that catch. <laughs> All right, Keith, what is your first tweet? Sure. Um, so I've got uh, one here from Alberta teacher Dan Scratch. Uh, and this one spoke to me a little bit because I, I do know a lot of teachers. My mom used to be one. Um, so he goes, I miss my students. I miss being in a classroom. I miss feeling nervous and getting hyped up at the start of a lesson. I miss seeing students make connections in class. I miss seeing my students roll their eyes at me when I try to be funny. Uh, and I really like that one because I, you know, I think for some people who suggest that maybe this is a bit of a holiday for teachers, um, at least for some of them, that, that is certainly not the case. For sure, if you're a passionate teacher, and both my parents were teachers, both the, my my grandparents were teachers. It's kind of the family business, although I'm not one. Um, yeah, they are passionate teachers. Just will hate the thought that they're not they're missing this va valuable time with their students. You know, you only have so many hours to work with these kids, and they're they're flitting by, flitting by, flitting by. And I don't know. I'm I'm really. I'm kind of really skeptical of the um, the ability to reach kids at home and get them to do work and you know keep up with their schoolwork at home. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but I'm I'm not. I, I think I don't think I we're think very good legitimate. at it yet. Yeah, I think <laughs> that's legitimate for sure. Yeah. All right, my first one is from uh, author and business analyst Bruno Macias, and I'm just guessing at the pronunciation there. Macias probably, and he said I think he's from uh, Ontario. Quote. I think I know how the virus will change the world. It will bring back, it will bring scarcity back. If resources can only be obtained by depriving others of these, of those resources, then we have a fundamentally different economy, primitive means of accumulation, more and more goods become exclusive. The price of a table at a restaurant is the price of keeping everyone else out so you can be safe which is kind of a scary. It is. It's kind of a grim, <laughs> grim thought that that's how it's going to be like, 
But think about it, Keith. Like if you need social distancing at a hockey game, suddenly you're going to have one third of the people uh, who could go to Rogers Place to see the Oilers play. Yep. That's a possibility, right? Like that, that, that kind of thing could happen. It is, and I, I think I'm more worried about it kind of on a global scale um, with scarcity at certain resources and how certain countries or blocks of countries will try to secure their resources to the expense of others, right? And, and wars certainly are, are a possibility in that kind of situation. We already know from Professor Simon Evanet at the uh, one of the universities in Switzerland, who's a global expert, um, just how uh, you know dozens and dozens and dozens of countries have put up trade barriers in terms of um, the export of medical equipment, which they no longer have allowed for certain periods. It's already happened, um, although some countries are now backing down from that. All right, my next tweet is a more on the lighter side. This is fr- this is under the hashtag of isolation advice, and it's from uh, a Canadian called Amanda at Mandolin. To whoever needs to hear this right now, A, you aren't hungry. B, don't cut your own hair. <laughs> Good advice if you can if you can do it. At some point, <laughs> you have to eat and you have to cut your hair for pitting the people around you who, who have to put up with <laughs> Mr. Shaggy. I'm, uh, <laughs> I've already grown a beard at one point uh, and it had to go. It just, <laughs> I couldn't take it anymore. So, um, but uh, yes, if you, the longer you can put it off, I, I agree. Um, my next tweet uh, is from uh, conservative U.S. political commentator Jesse Kelly. Uh, and he goes, uh, have you taken the time to upload a picture of a random stranger who wasn't bothering you, but also wasn't quarantining the way you see fit today? If not, get on it. Your country needs you. And uh, I'm, I'm not entirely sure if Jesse is... is kidding there if that's satire that was, or what that was sarcastic I'm okay sure. all right I, i'm glad to, <laughs> i hope that's what it is but it does sort of raise an interesting debate of what happens if you do see people who are kind of flouting the, the social distancing rules at this point right is education the right thing do you go up and say something do you let it go uh, do you report them uh you know it, it's uh it's kind of an interesting debate, and we've seen from some of your other tweets that people have approached this in very, very different ways, not all with success. There's just a level of, I don't know if you felt this, but I felt it when I'm out there in public. Well, I feel, I've, I have felt a level of hostility to my fellow citizens that I've never felt before. The other night, for instance, someone walked by me and was smoking, and um, I thought, I could smell the smoke, and I thought, that smoke was in your lungs <laughs> and now <laughs> it's in the air and it's in mm, my yeah. lungs. And I just, I just thought you so-and-so like that is, uh, and is that irrational? Probably, uh, maybe, uh, but it certainly was hostile. And, and a, a jogger went by, joggers go by. And I, as soon as I see a jogger come and I just hit, I just go, cause you know, there's that, like with joggers, apparently there's the, the 20 foot rule where they got to be 20 because they project so far their breath. And who knows? Like, I don't know. But again, and whether any of this is real or not, I think I felt hostility. Now, maybe I'm an unusually hostile person. That's definitely a possibility. But, uh, (laughs) or we're all starting to feel this. And I think, I think a lot of people are, and this could be, this is a real problem in terms of public life going forward, the mistrust, the hostility that we're going to feel um, and how do businesses, how are they going to cope with this? Restaurants, movie theaters, cruise ships, uh, you know, hockey games, th- festivals, theaters. That's just a nightmare. And a... It's, it's going to be fascinating to watch <laughs> how, how, once we get past this. You're right. Yep. Go ahead. What's your okay. next one? Oh, my next one. Yes. Um, so this one comes from uh, the managing editor of Human Events not sure which human events, um, someone by the name of Ian Miles Chong. Um, According to conspiracy theorists, the coronavirus is either a deadly bioweapon designed to end all human life or an absolute nothing burger, no worse than the flu, that is also a hoax. um, Just, uh, I think, uh, a nice summing up there of um, how uh, um, some of the conspiracy theories perhaps don't have a lot to do with logic or consistency. So it's, uh, but it is interesting to see that both extremes uh, that we have seen through this pandemic. 
Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think extreme anxiety breeds extreme thoughts in a lot of people. This is from uh, retired CTV journalist Alan Fryer, and he tweets, quote, the outright refusal by the Trudeau liberals to even acknowledge, let alone criticize China's lies and cover up, along with the WHO's complicity, is both mystifying and deeply disturbing. What do you think, Keith? Well, yeah, I mean, there is a lot to criticize about China's performance here. And I think we're learning more day by day uh, just how um, badly that country uh, communicated with the world about uh, the nature of this virus. Um, whether it's appropriate or whether it's uh, useful to criticize the WHO, the Canadian government, uh, Donald Trump, who all at one point... Um, repeated a lot of the messaging coming out of China, have yet to uh, criticize them to, for certain things. Um, I don't know how useful that is. I, I think this is a country that we are still going to need to have a relationship with uh, beyond this pandemic. Um, but it is clear that um, there is a lot to criticize from China at this point. Um, it's, it's an interesting debate. Listen, we, we just got a plane load of supplies on Sunday, which the Premier Kenny uh, applauded and which which I certainly applaud uh, from China, came from China. And we badly need those supplies. At the same time, there, there there's just not a scintilla of doubt at this point that that from whenever this broke out in late November, sometime in December, till the middle of January, uh, at some point the... Various levels of officials, first local officials, then national officials in China heard, knew about this and came to understand there was human-to-human -human transmission. And their first instinct was to cover up, cover up, cover up, cover up, cover up, and to persecute the, the doctors who are spreading this information, to lie to the WHO and other international organizations, and, he's, and essentially to fool everyone from the WHO to Donald Trump to Justin Trudeau, to Dr. Tam, they they believed. Now there, the, somewhere you could argue, somewhere more open to believing China than others, and we won't get into that. But China has a lot to answer for here, and that system of government, the weakness in that system of government, is something that we all have to really think hard about. Because, man, they they, they screwed up, and we're all paying the price. What's your next one? Yeah, I have one here from uh, CBC Toronto, um, and with, it has a link to, uh, to a web story. Uh, if people go to your uh, go to your post here, they will they will be able to read the story. So it goes: the federal government is considering introducing legislation to make it an offense to knowingly spread misinformation that could harm people. So this is this is interesting, right? This is. Um, I think going to be seen by free speech advocates as a potential problem. Um, obviously, you know, we'll see if they actually do bring forward some legislation, what it contains. But um, I, if this actually goes forward, I think it needs to be it needs to have a very, very high threshold, uh, so that someone you have to be able to prove that somebody knowingly knew the the information was incorrect and intended to harm people by spreading that misinformation. And even then, I have a feeling there's going to be some charter challenges to it. So this is a dangerous road to go down for the Trudeau government. I think, Keith, this is equal parts totalitarian and asinine. It, it, like, they, they need to have some pretty good examples of why they need this. Because, you know, I understand there are some, like, apparently there's cell phone towers being burned down in England because some people think that 5G is related to this. Mm. That's that's one of the, that now that's an example of a bad rumor that, people shouldn't spread and, 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 um, you know, you know, at least without condemning, which I just did, uh, well, <laughs> well, at the same time voicing it, but the example they gave, the government gave, and was CBC was putting out there was, you know, if uncle Bob spreads a rumor that the virus came from a, a lab and it was, uh, created in a lab in Wuhan, well, hello, are you not reading the newspapers? The Washington post, the Washington post just printed, you know, a story saying that 
a couple years ago, U.S. Uh, investigators were seriously concerned about the health, the safety at, at that Wuhan lab. And we don't know where this virus came from. Uh, we'll probably never know, but there is a possibility, and it can't be ruled out, um, that that it that it leaked out of that lab somehow. Pro you know, one would think most likely by accident, just because you know s some mistake happened. But this isn't just a conspiracy theory that needs to be prosecuted by the Canadian government. This is something that's being reported by the Washington Post, you know, one of the most respected newspapers in the world. So the example that they gave just, I think, highlighted how ridiculous this whole notion is. Again, we need to have a full public debate. And the best, the best remedy for terrible information and bad rumors is good information. And people um, speaking out against the stupid idea that you know 5G is somehow related to this, like that's crazy, and frankly, it's crazy not to have a talk that that you know to say that we can't have a talk that this might have leaked out of the the Wuhan lab. You know, that's the kind of thing that needs to be investigated. Maybe we need to shut down that lab, and maybe we need to say to China, for instance, hey, no more trade with us until you shut down that lab. Something like that might be reasonable going forward. So I just think the Liberals have got to back off this completely. This this was this should have been I hope this was a trial balloon that, that just popped right in their faces personally. I just think it it's may nuts. well have been yeah I mean if that's the example you they're using I agree with you that that's a that's a real lousy example to justify any kind of legislation like that. I could see it theoretically having a little bit more um, relevance to somebody who is found to like spread bad public health information like you should do this or that to avoid getting the virus that is completely incorrect um you know that in that case maybe you could you could justify it but uh, the, the kind of story you're talking about no <laughs> that is not uh that is not useful um and not something that the trudeau government should be pursuing Alrighty, uh my next one will be uh it's something that i'm going to be writing about um and it's something I tweeted about. So it's the latest save, survey from the Edmonton Chamber of Commerce on attitudes of Edmonton businesses right now. And uh, so right now, the already we're um, 30 days a month into the lockdown here, 4.8% of Edmonton businesses have already gone out of business that were surveyed. Um, and, and that's about 300 businesses, 300 to 400 businesses that were surveyed here. 58% fear they may go out of business going forward and 55% have laid off staff. So, um, yeah, not good, times, is it? Keith, <laughs> <laughs> not good. No. Oh God, my heart goes out to all those businesses. And I know a lot, you know, I know lots of people who run businesses. You, you know, lots of people and you, you know how they put their heart into it. And they employ all kinds of people. They do all kinds of good things. And this is just heartbreaking. It, it, it is just absolutely uh, discouraging. And I talked to Janet Riappel from the Edmonton Chamber of Commerce. And she says, this is so, this is so painful. She doesn't need, it's hard even to talk about it. I mean, I, but we're going to, we've got to talk about it. These are some of, these are, we just can't talk about death statistics. We have to talk about the pain on the other side because we've got to balance those two things and try to find a way forward while doing yeah. that yeah it's uh, it is very very concerning um it's uh, similar to some statistics that were revealed at uh, city council yesterday about uh, businesses that are experiencing supply chain disruptions you know and that's certainly one thing that could affect their ability to continue on um, and we're seeing increasing numbers of business that, that businesses that aren't able to get the kind of so the supplies that they need, uh, materials that they need. Um, we're also hearing more and more that one of the main concerns from businesses is ability to pay rent, right? And so yeah. there's now been some discussion from the federal government that some rent um, relief is coming for, for small businesses, uh, which, but whether it gets here in time, whether it's going to be enough, uh, these are all very, very big concerns. But uh, if the if those numbers continue to increase uh, and actually prove um, culminate in businesses having having to actually shut down, um, we're going to be in a pretty bad state come late summer, fall. Uh, and I uh, I think a lot of our efforts have to go into making sure that that doesn't happen. I did a uh, survey actually on Twitter, just a Twitter survey. So take it for what it's worth. 
and you know, I, I'm not saying my question was even very good, might have been awkwardly worded, but here's what I asked people. When would you yourself be willing to risk going back to work or school, given current trends and new safety practices with coronavirus? I said in May, June, July or August or September or later. And 45% um, said they're, they, they're willing to go back in May, 20% in June, 15% said July, August, and 20% said they'd be willing to wait September or later. Interesting. So, um, yeah, there's a huge, you know, the majority of people are, are certainly willing themselves. They're, they're saying, I think we've all got our heads around the risk now. Uh, we know what it is. We've all thought through personally what it means to us, but, you know, uh, the the majority of people are saying let's let's go sooner than later. What's your next one? Uh, this is my last one. Uh, this comes from pollster Angus Reed in BC, um, and uh, he goes, "The paternalism is getting out of hand. We all know that normal is a long way off, but what about partial opening? What about a plan? What about a plan for a plan?" Other places are having discussions. BC residents are being treated like school kids enough. So I don't know uh, a whole lot about what's going on in BC. I've been more focused on Alberta and Canada in general. Uh, but this is uh, an interesting tweet because it does sort of bring up the debate uh, that we're seeing now more and more uh, in our daily discourse on social media and so on about let's 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 end the lockdown, let's start reopening the economy. And all of our public health officials and political leaders are basically saying we're not ready to do that. We've still got several more weeks, if not months of this. But what I think would help uh, is that if we could actually put out a kind of a rough plan. Now it has to be couched, right? But if you can say to somebody, if we reach certain thresholds, maybe this is the date when we can start relaxing some of the restrictions. This is the date when we can start reopening on a limited basis certain kinds of facilities. Uh, and I, I think that would give people hope or something to look forward to. But again, it's a little bit risky because if we don't reach the thresholds, if things change, and with this virus, things change almost daily, um, there's a good chance we'll have to revise the plan. So if, if you can get people to understand it on that level, I still think it could be a good thing. There's a funny risk reward for politicians and medical health, and certainly for medical health officers. All they have to think about is is the health, right? Public health, that's their sole focus. That's what they should be thinking. But for politicians even, if they open too soon and then there's a huge increase in the number of deaths, like the 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 the, the political pain that they suffer from that is immense, you know, as opposed to just kind of playing it cautious. Now, so the, and some of the countries that aren't playing it cautious, like Sweden has taken a fair amount of heat, but, and, and we... The, the the other comp confounding factor is, Keith, so Sweden has a higher death rate than most other European countries right now because of this, but their hospitals aren't overwhelmed, apparently. And we won't, I, we really won't know for a year or two years who, who did this best, like who was able to keep their economy going best while also uh, mitigating deaths over time. Because we, like with second and third waves, maybe Sweden isn't because, you know, if there's more herd immunity there. Uh, maybe they're not going to get as hit that hard right. in the second or third waves. And maybe the total deaths of these other countries will be the same as Sweden over time, but they will have experienced less economic dislocation because of their approach. So it's a very complicated, uh, difficult issue. I completely agree with you. And I asked Dr. Hinshaw about this yesterday. Like, what are the indicators that you're going to try to use in terms of opening things up? And, you know, she's she's talked about... Uh, the capacity of the healthcare system to handle cases and the infection, the both the hospitalization rate and the ICU rate, which right now are really underutilized in Alberta. Yes. So as long as that's the case, I think that I think that we're going to start. Those seem to be the indicators she's going to look at. So I think that we, uh, I think that we might start to see something in May. And to give Jason Kenny credit, he is one of the few Canadian politicians who's put out a relaunch plan, who's talked about. The, the testing program that we're going to have 20,000 uh, tests per day. He's hoping by the end of May and other measures that, that he's looking at taking more wearing of public face masks, that kind of thing. But he hasn't put, he hasn't put it. It's not really exact, but at least he, he has a relaunch plan. So that's a start. Yeah. And I would like, I'd like to see it more on a federal level as well. Um, and, 
even in Alberta, I think, you know, uh, or, or the city, you know, if we can start getting to a point where we can say by such and such a date, uh, this is what we're hoping to achieve, right? And I, I mean, that's, that's the thing that I, I think, as you said, is dangerous for politicians. You have to make people understand that these are aspirational goals. These, these aren't firm set in stone deadlines because things are going to change. We just don't know how this is going to proceed. But it would be nice to give people something to look forward to. I, hey, I think Kennedy sh Kenny should pick a date because uh, there's nothing like a date to, to focus people. And maybe he'll do that late later this week, tomorrow or early next week. Just say on we've decided and Ang Angela Merkel just, just did this in Germany uh, in early May. We're going to start with a phased approach on this date. We're going to do this on that. Now, you can always delay that. But I think having a having that deadline gives hope and it gives focus and I don't see a downside in, in, in proceeding in that way. So I'm looking for, I'm, this is my call for tomorrow. I'm looking for, you know, <laughs> we have scored. He, Kenny likes to talk in terms of Second World War analogies. He's talking about like, this is like the London Blitz. Well, we've had the scorched earth policy. We need to know when D-Day is. So uh, right. uh, at exactly. least for the first phase. <laughs> All righty. Um, my last one, Keith, is Ontario doctor and political commentator David Jacobs. Uh, who's a who's a pretty serious critic. Uh, he's cons conservative, serious critic of the Trudeau government, and he's and he says, "quote For all my criticism of the Trudeau government handling of COVID nineteen, one thing that I will commend them on is putting the health of Canadians ahead of the economy. Aggressive social distancing distancing has made a huge difference." Unquote. So uh, good for him. Um, praising the uh gives him more credibility he's got a lot of credibility in this because he is a medical doctor but um for for recognizing that that um you know they really for all the mistakes they've made and i've gone on and on about that you know the mistakes that were made by the trudeau government um they, they are getting out that message all forms of all levels of government are really really pushing hard right now and getting out the right message to all of us and they they um they do deserve some praise for that. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I'd add to that is, you know, there was a dichotomy drawn there in that tweet between the economy uh, and, and saving lives and, and saving the health system. I would say that the two are linked in many re respects, right? If we, if we uh, didn't put in these aggressive social distancing measures, uh, if we didn't try to build the capacity of the health system and we just focused on keeping the economy going at, at a full clip, um, I think we would actually hurt the economy uh, in the end because the health system would get overwhelmed. People would have to stay home. Um, there, there was no, I don't think it was an either or proposition here. I think uh, we had to, we had to do what we did in part to save the economy. I, I agree with you. And I, so it's, it's not either or, but there was a one, two. And I think this is what he might be getting at here. Right. You had to, because we didn't know what was going to happen and we didn't know what capacity we had, we weren't versed in best practices. We had to put health first. We had to, we have to take care of the health piece first and then we can move on to the next piece because, and what we see is the economies that have done best in the world or the countries that have kept most open, like Taiwan uh, in particular, put in the most stringent of all health measures right off the top. And um, they're 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 going full steam ahead. So that seemed to be, in terms of the the best initial strategy, um, I think that uh, that was the best strategy. And the criticism the Trudeau government is getting from Jacobs and other people, including me, is that they didn't do enough on uh, at the borders and on the health side right out of the gate, uh, and we're playing catch up. But but they are getting out the right message now. Alrighty. Are you got anything else? Are we? That's are we it. I'm done. No, it, it was that was a good roundup. No, I appreciate uh, you putting together the list every day. So there's lots to choose from. People should check it out. All right. Thanks again for talking, Keith. And uh, thanks everyone for listening. And uh, be safe. Take care, everyone. <laughs>